Our opening words this morning are by George Squires, to be a UU. To be a UU is a journey of faith. We will never be the same again. It changes us to our very core. We are not here for that ride. A service of lifetime is our call, meeting all the unexpected head on, but we are not alone. In the midst of all, it is the beloved community. It is more than a name, our declaration of action. This is who we are. The world has been through a lot of hell and indications point to a lot more on the way. Injustice never takes a vacation. Man's inhumanity to man continues at full speed. We are in it for the long run. This is not a faith for the faint hearted. Being a UU is no walk in the park, but it is well worth it. This is what it is to be a UU. Treva will light the chalice here in the sanctuary. I invite you to light your own chalice and place it where it can be seen by all of us if you're able. At times, our own light goes out and it is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lit the flame within us and the community. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before we sing the first hymn, let me remind you at home to leave yourself muted. However, we want you and whoever is with you to sing with Mary as big and loud as you like. Make it a joyous experience. For the rest of you here, Please wear a mask if you wish to actively participate in singing the hymns. So let's sing the opening hymn, Sovereign and Transforming Grace, number 33 in the hymnal. Mary? Sovereign and transforming grace, we invoke your quickening power. Reign the spirit of this place. Bless the purpose of this hour. Holy and creative light, we invoke your kindling ray. Upon our spirits night as the darkness turns to day to the anxious soul impart hope all other hopes above stir the dull and hardened heart with the you all. Nice to hear voices again. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Community of Cambria. We're glad you have joined us today. We acknowledge that our UUCC sanctuary stands on land that was originally occupied by coastal Chumash indigenous peoples whose ancestors lived primarily in the San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. As a Unitarian Universalist community, we celebrate religious diversity and welcome all who journey in search of faith and spirituality. The UUCC is a lay-led congregation inviting speakers from different religious traditions and spiritual or scientific backgrounds to speak at our pulpit. We encourage presentations covering a variety of topics and areas of interest to our community that connect with our seven principles. Today's service centers around the second principle. We affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. 
Compassion is something that we can easily act on individually. We can demonstrate openness, give people respect, and treat people with kindness on our own. But we need one another to achieve equity and justice. It points us to the larger community. It promotes collective responsibility. It reminds us that treating people as human beings is not simply something we do one-on-one, -on -one, but something that has a systemic, has systemic implications and can inform our entire cultural way of being. My name is Judy Butler, and I am your worship associate this morning. I'd like to expand, extend a special welcome to today's guests and visitors. We're glad you joined us this morning. If you're not on our mailing list, please visit our website at www.uucambria.org so that we can keep you informed about all of our activities. And please check out What's Happening, a weekly e-blast sent to all our members and friends. This is a great way to keep up with the latest news in our community. And a reminder, if you wish to see this or any of our past Zoom services, again, Recordings of these services can be found on the UUCC website and Facebook as well. The membership committee invites non-members to consider joining our community. Please contact Janet Cooper or a person on the board if you are interested. Thank you. So again, good morning and welcome to everyone. The affirmation is both a recognition of the nature of our community as well as well as a promise we make and aspire to. So let us now recite our affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service is his prayer. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and freedom and to help one another. We set aside this time for any short announcements that would be of interest to our UU community members and friends. Please keep your items short and to the point. For any items that need more explanation, please call or email the person after the service to be respectful of everyone's time. If you have an announcement, please raise your hand or your Zoom hand by clicking on the raised hand button in the reactions icon. When Andy calls your name, please unmute yourself, then speak. Treva. Morning all, there is a, where's the camera? That one. <laughs> Good morning all. Um, there is a board meeting tomorrow night at five o'clock. I believe we are on Zoom again. So if you are interested, uh, please do email a board member and we will get you that link. Thank you. Yes, Nancy. Good morning. Um, I just want to let you know that the Moving Towards Racial Justice is going to be working through the book, Me and White Supremacy. Um, our next meeting is the second Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. Um, so uh, this next meeting, since we're just starting this book, is to read the whole introduction. It's about 25, 30 pages, and then do the first two days of prompts. Thank you. Hope you can join us. It's always open to anybody. Anyone else here in the sanctuary? Okay, Andy, anyone in the Zoom world? Yes, indeed. Lou, would you please unmute and share your announcement? Uh, good morning. Men's group meets tomorrow in a hybrid meeting, either in the sanctuary or by Zoom. Okay, thank you, Lou. Anyone else in the larger world? I don't see any more hands. Back to you, Judy. All right. Next week, Dolores Miera will read Emotional Intelligence and Leadership by Dory Davenport Thexton and Daniel Goleman.
Today, being the third Sunday of the month, we welcome a witness to our virtual pulpit. A moment of witness is widely practiced in Christian and Islamic denominations as a means to bear witness or give testimony about the way a specific religious affiliation has impacted one's life. Our hope is that in their moment of witness, a congregant here can briefly share a significant experience that moved them, helping all of us to deepen our relationships with Unitarian Universalism and strengthen our ties to the community. Nancy Tholen, please come forward and share with us this morning. Thank you, Judy. Okay, I didn't really know what a moment of witness was. <laughs> so, this might not be exactly right, but to me, I see religion as those little moments of awe that you witness throughout a day. So every day I look for little moments that give me joy. The translucent waves glowing aqua or celadon, the white fountains of spray as the waves smash the cliffs, tens of fleeting waterfalls running back to the sea, running into friends and pointing out the dolphins arcing near the kelp beds, the warmth of sun and smiles, the sound of turkeys soothing gobbles. I love that. <laughs> the, the fog drifting ahead of me, a shaft of light through the trees stirs my heart. The taste of fresh ros rob the taste of fresh raspberries or nectarines or chocolate. These and other moments of joy are everywhere. What will your senses appreciate today? Thank you, Nancy. Sharing together some of our personal and significant joys and concerns brings us closer as a faith community. We invite you to share the milestones that are deeply felt as part of your personal life. But please be mindful and considerate of all who came to worship with us this morning. This is a time of community building. If the collective flames of these candles embody all the joys and sorrows which may have gone unspoken today, but are also deeply felt in this community. The first reading is titled Black Lash by Marianne Anderson. I felt the belt, but not the whip. After weeks, welts left no marks, but the memory planted itself into my soul like a weed that all the therapy in the world could not eradicate. The lashes they gave your forebearers sank deeper, scars like tattoos, reminders of your subjugation, generations of memories etched into you like uninvited DNA. I do not fear suppression. I walk the streets protected by my armor of whiteness, while you, my sister, always on the lookout, avoid recognition when sirens blare, your streets peppered with shell casings. Head down, quick-footed, your safety net torn to shreds. You give your son the talk braid your daughter's hair while warning them of the dangers of wearing the dark skin they cannot shed. And when you rise up, take the whip into your hands and swing that I may feel the lash of your blackness. Let us join in a time of meditation, of prayer and of silence. Let us seek the quiet and the calm laying aside our struggles. And in the silence, may there be a reverence in our hearts, a thankfulness within our spirit, and a deepened understanding of the meaning of our lives. Let us enter the stillness.
please come back now. The second reading is titled My Life by Gwen Gorg, an African American poet, activist, documentarian, and instructor living on the Big Island of Hawaii. I accept full responsibility for my life with grace and ease, knowing that it is a divine expression, knowing that I am an individualized reflection of my beloved creator. I receive the joy, the life that is everywhere present. In this presence, I know it is not possible for me to negate my incarnation because my intention to awaken is sincere. I honor, respect, and accept myself. And just as I extend compassion for others, just as I make room in my heart for myself, so do I make room in my heart for my brothers and sisters on this planet, all planets, and universes. In spite of all the encounters of negativity, my life is amazingly, incredibly, gloriously fantastic because I deem it so. Please join us in singing All Are Called by Kimberly Davis and Kias Hartwood. Mary. <laughs> Today, 
we continue with our annual Summer Sermons by Other People series. During the month of August, members of the UU community of Cambria will present sermons written and delivered by UU ministers or other prominent members of the religious and academic communities. Our readers are required to seek permission to present these sermons, and the sermon will be introduced by the reader. Today's sermon is titled, The Missing Remnant by Reverend Sophia Betancourt, and it's to be read by the Wonders of Zoom from Hawaii by Marianne Anderson. Marianne? Thank you and aloha all. Uh, this morning's sermon is written by Assistant Professor of Theology and Ethics at Star King Stool School for the Ministry, Sophia Betancourt. Her work as a religious educator, parish minister, and seminary professor provide well-honored leadership qualities and prompted the UUA board to, support, to appoint her interim co-president of the UUA Commission for Institutional Change on April 10th, 2017. This sermon was delivered June 21st, 2018 at the service of the living tradition, which honors religious professionals reaching ministry milestones in the preceding year. We are on a journey toward redemption. We have lived a year filled with lamentation, with the promise of generations, the failures of every day and the deep down gritty messiness that is the promise of our salvation. There is inherent goodness that exists between and among us. I want to honor the weary, ragged miracle that is our living tradition. Oh, my loves, when I addressed you at last year's General Assembly, it was a time of renewed promise, of reinvestment in who we best know ourselves to be. And it was a time when our energy was kindled a bit by fear, fear that we might lose one another, fear that naming our entanglement with white supremacy would prove the undoing of our liberating faith. We sent ourselves home with work to do, knowing that the struggles in our association were a small reflection of the larger struggles of our nation. We were called once again to accountability at home, even as we worked for justice in the world. I have to say that this has been a year of steadfastness in religious leadership. It's been far from perfect, but there are those among us who have worked beyond all reason to keep us accountable to this journey of dismantling white supremacy in Unitarian Universalism. They have my profound gratitude and respect. And when I say that we have a steadfastness in our religious leadership, I mean everyone who is associated with us. All of you who have heard your values and your dreams of faithful living expressed in our congregations and communities and have chosen to cast your lot among us. All of you who have brought your heartache, your failure, your unbounded hope, and your potential to Unitarian Universalism. All of you most impacted by this work who have remained in our communities, even when we have offered you less than what your spirit deserves. During this celebration, when we honor those dedicated to the work of our living tradition, we honor each and every one of you. Now it has been a year when those being celebrated have not only achieved the milestones we ask of our professional leaders, but have done it in the midst of that unending work of responding to the needs of a nation in turmoil and an association deep in self-reflection. We honor as well those retiring from career long service and a too often uncelebrated dedication to the healing and wholeness of this world. We rightly pause to honor the, this depth of commitment in times when we do not entirely know what journey will, what our journey will ask of us, only that the work itself worthy of sacrifice. In a world where white supremacy and all other forms of oppression that feed on one another, all the logics of domination are blamed on the most ludicrous things, 
sleep medication, absent-minded employees, habit, resource scarcity in the nation shaped by greed, religion itself. We are called more than ever to testify with our lives. Poet and prophet Audre Lorde told those embarking on a next great journey that it was their small actions, their everyday decisions and how they moved through this world that not only gave them power, but would define our future. She did not offer them a great redeeming moment. She simply steered them back to the daily struggle, to what we might call faithful living. This is about the journey of redemption. Now imagine that some of you are tired of this conversation. The work of dismantling oppression can feel endless at times. In our tiredness, we sometimes fear that speaking the truth of our own complicity somehow invalidates the good that we have done in the world. Instead, I see it as a sign of our commitment to task that must rest in our faithfulness if it is ever to succeed. It will take a strength larger than our individual beliefs, larger than our collective intention to reshape our surrounding culture. We seek to reform Unitarian Universalism because we can never be the bearers of love and justice that the world so desperately needs if the foundation that sustains us is still perpetuating the very problems we long to solve. I know that we grow weary, some of us because our lived realities rarely require that we build the stamina for staying in the struggle day by day, whether we want to or not. Some of us because the long haul living with the daily requirement of justifying our humanity is unspeakably depleting. Some of us because our faith is profoundly challenged each time we debate whether and how much this work matters at this point in our history. I want to remind us, myself included, that it is the promise of our faith that calls us to this work. And it is the integrity of living the values we bear witness to in a world that requires us to focus our energy this way. Beloveds, we are the theological inheritors of teachings on universal salvation. There is no winnowing out of the supposedly unworthy that can be named sacred among us. It is our very universalism that is at stake when we turn away from the impact that our institutions have on the same communities and groups that society encourage us to dehumanize and make small. This is not a new story. When I look for something to hold on to in these days, when the death struggles of institutionalized white supremacy and heteropatriarchal, cap, heteropatriarchal capitalism are attacking every group thrown to the margins to justify unearned privilege and immoral gains, I turn to the wisdom of activists who have long taught us that liberation is collective. Many of us know the words attributed to the indigenous Australian activist, Lila Watson. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Watson herself reminds us that this wisdom has grown collectively from activists and organizers. So I want to bring us back to one of our own, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who is remembered for teaching us that we are all bound up together. Collective salvation was not a new idea at the time, though Harper predates the theologians in our tradition best, is best known for embracing this worldview. In 1866, flanked by white allies, Elizabeth Cayley, Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony at the 11th National Women's Rights Convention in New York City, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper insisted 
that we are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity. And society cannot trample on the weakest of its members without receiving the curse in its own soul. Harper, a freeborn Black woman who belonged to both Unitarian and AME churches, lived her life using her relative privilege to fight for the freedom of her people, all of her people. This beautifully intersectional abolitionist organized for women's suffrage alongside the ending of slavery and civil rights for all. She challenged us on the dire consequences of oppression and how the violence we inflict on those we convince ourselves are less worthy harms not only those who, whose sacredness we dishonor, but irrevocably violates our own souls as well. I'm not going to continue quoting from her speech because the accepted ableist language of her time has no place in a modern pulpit. But I want to us to understand that we are also inheritors of Harper's insistence that there is a level of immorality worse than the systemic oppression we are giving so much very, very much of ourselves to uproot from our beloved communities. When the poetry poured from this black mother's heart, she unflinchingly called the nation to account for reaching out to peoples of African descent for help in a time of great need, then utterly rejecting them once again in times of safety. Beloveds, I am not suggesting we are repeating the depths of infamy, to use Harper's words, of Civil War America, but I am experiencing echoes that frighten me. The journey toward redemption includes truth telling. And I'm going to ask you to bear with me for a minute, trusting that I know every congregational and communal situation is complex, just as I know that we can do better that I can do better. This is a year when we have rightly thanked our gifted religious educators for their compassionate investment in our faith formation through the white supremacy teach-ins. I have heard anecdotally that this is also a year when many religious educators of a wide range of racial and ethnic identities, including white co-conspirators, have struggled with ministerial supervisors who are not as committed to this work. This is a time when more than 800 of our congregations, <clears throat> excuse me, have engaged in communal learning about dismantling white supremacy. And it is also a time when we have needed interventions from the UUA and received negotiated resignations from religious professionals of color at unprecedented levels. Let me be clear, when we do this work, we almost always ask more of the people most impacted by it, project our greatest fears onto them, and allow the system to remove them rather than sustain the deep culture-changing work required for us to truly live our values in the world. And this is not just about race or ethnicity. It is about every disempowered group in our leadership. I would ask you to make it a part of your faithful living to learn about the stories of our religious leaders who live with disabilities, who identify as transgender, non-binary, or gender non-conforming. Learn about how our congregations are treating women, making space for people with a range of class identities, embracing queer religious professionals, or responding to the leadership of people of color. Notice the things our beloveds feel justified in saying to us about our appearances, particularly to those who are fat. This list goes on and on. It is past time that we stop expecting extra help from those we impact the most, then burdening them with the behaviors that come from our own wrestling with grief and dismay in the aftermath. Let us find better ways, better ways to care for our souls in times of change. I am begging you. The journey toward redemption is about truth-telling, lamentation, 
and owning our wrongs, while at the same time claiming the profound possibility that calls us forward. We are the inheritors of the legacies of white supremacy, but also of an unimaginable grace, of certainty in the possibility of redemption, of weaving a tapestry of leadership that may not yet be what we long for, but is called to be the richest expression of humanity's sacredness. We believe in human capacity great enough, God-loving enough, values strong enough, communities dedicated enough, and leaders humble enough to move us toward redemption. And I think we know that redemption is a shared ministry that means everyone, that elevates us all, that seeks out the suffering, neglected places in the world and breathes the holy back into them. Redemption is a professional religious leadership that is humble, that apologizes, and that limits its own power to move us toward a greater truth. Moving in that direction means trying even when we don't know how it can ever come to pass. Trying because the struggle itself is holy. It means celebrating the successes that do in fact exist among us, elevating them and putting them to the service of creating even greater success. At this time, it is modeling that the reality of our failings is not more powerful than the inherent goodness that we teach. We are left asking ourselves, what will we risk for this grace? The thing is, I believe in our callings. Yes, many of us are called to professional religious leadership. We agreed to be there in the difficult moments and in the successes and celebrations, and we promise to wrestle and show up even if our hearts are breaking. But we also promise to understand that every member and friend of a Unitarian Universalist community is also there by calling. We are called collectively to this great experiment in communal salvation. Whether we arrived in this faith by birth or by choice or by everyday expression of our values in the world, that matters. What will you risk for this grace? Where lies your hope for our interwoven salvation? To my colleagues whose chosen absence we mourn, for all who serve in spite of what has been done to them, it is strange to say I remember you every time I watch Black Panther again. Is it during that moment near the end of the film when Takala calls Nakia, I think I know a way that you can still fulfill your calling. Please stay. Oh, my loves, please stay. I believe in the power of our calling. I believe in saving the soul of our nation and that we cannot show up authentically for that struggle if we ignore the one right here, right in this community of faith. I am asking you to love us even when we don't deserve you, but not at the expense of your health or well being, either physical or spiritual. Do lean into the fierce and fabulous network of those who share some of your identity-shaped experiences and know that you are never alone. The good news is that we are in control of what we do with our daily living. If we, each one of us, represent a missing remnant in the fabric of our collective future, then together, we can lean into a possibility that we have yet to fully experience in human history, a collective wholeness, an unassailable good. That is the kind of salvation I am here to fight for in the small moments of every single day. So let us hold ourselves accountable to this journey toward redemption. Immerse yourself unapologetically in what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist in these days. 
then go out into the world and live knowing that your faith matters. May the poetry of our hearts set us free. Amen, Ashe, and blessed be. Thank you, Marianne. Wow. <laughs> the morning offering will now be given and received. Please keep in mind that our congregation is entirely self-governed by the democratic process. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all of the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and our institutional well-being. You are invited to participate in the blessing of giving. For those at home, please use one of the methods on the screen. Thank you. Jan. Thank you, Jan. All thanks, our thanks for all gifts given and received for the work of this community. As our doxology today, we will sing Spirit of Life. Oh, yeah. 
Beautiful. All right, for our closing hymn, please join in singing Break Not the Circle, number 323. Mary? Break not the circle of enabling love where people grow forgiven and forgiving. Break not that circle, make it wider still till it includes, embraces all the living. Come wonder at this love that comes to life where words of freedom are with humor spoken and people keep no score of wrong and guilt but will that human bond remain unbroken join them the movement of the love that frees till people of whatever race or nation will truly be themselves stand on their feet see eye to eye with laughter and elation Let us now recite the valediction. The flame of this chalice will no longer burn today, but the light of the flame within our hearts continues to shine brightly, illuminating the love felt in our community. And please extinguish your chalice at home now. <clears throat> After the benediction, please click on the Valor Gallery View button in the upper right corner of your screen, but please remain muted. Andy will call on you when you raise your Zoom hand. Marianne will give our benediction today. Thank you. A quote from Amelia Earhart, courage is the price that life exacts for granting peace. May we all have the courage to let, unquote, may we all have the courage to light the flame of love and compassion in our hearts and light up the good in all we see. <laughs>